any rock that is exposed to the elements begins to break down by a process known as weathering. If given enough time, weathering can reduce solid rock to tiny particles of soil or sediment. Weathering of bare rock involves both physical and chemical actions. The physical processes act to reduce the rock from one solid mass to a large number of small pieces. Chemical reactions then change the minerals in the rock to the kinds of compounds found in soil. Physical weathering is a process that breaks large masses of rock into smaller rocks. When rocks are exposed at the surface, small cracks develop for any one of a number of reasons. And when water runs into those cracks, into a small one like this one, and freezes, it expands, pushing the walls of the crack apart. Later, when the ice melts, water from above carries soil in, filling the crack. And when it freezes again, the water and soil combination pushes the crack apart a little more, slowly opening up this gap between the rocks. This process is called frost wedging, and it is responsible for converting small cracks like this one into much larger cracks like this one. Here on this quarry wall, frost wedging is pushing this large boulder out away from the rock face, and one day in a few years it will simply tumble to the floor below. Frost wedging can operate on a large scale to bring great masses of rock tumbling down. These great piles of rock called talus are the result of thousands of years of freezing and thawing in this Montana Valley. You can see this same process at work on a much smaller scale if you look along soil banks on a frosty winter morning. The first thing you will notice is thousands of small icy spires. Each spire formed when water in the soil beneath it froze. But if you look more closely, you will see that almost every spire has lifted an overlying grain of soil. As the rising sun melts the ice, these grains will fall down the slope just as rocks tumble off a mountainside. Water that seeps between mineral grains in a rock and freezes will cause the rock to break into fragments. Also, some minerals absorb water and expand, helping to break the solid rock into thousands of small grains that can be quickly weathered into soil. As water moves down along breaks in the rock, Weathering begins along the fracture surfaces. As weathering proceeds, it tends to form rounded or curved surfaces like this, resulting in large rounded boulders like these in the subsoil. The most important result of physical weathering is to increase the surface area on which chemical weathering can take place. We can see how the process works by using this block. Each side of the block has a surface area of 100 square centimeters. There are six sides, so the block has a total surface area of 600 square centimeters on which chemical weathering can act. If physical weathering were to break each surface of the block in half, each of the eight new blocks would have a surface area of 125 square centimeters. Altogether, there would now be an exposed area of 1,000 square centimeters. If each block were broken again, the total surface area would increase to over 20,000 square centimeters. So now we have many small fragments and a surface area of 30 times the amount exposed on the original block. Now we know how physical processes break down the rocks. But what about the chemical processes? 
How do they make soil out of rock minerals? The most important agents that carry on chemical weathering are already familiar to us. They are water, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. They act to break down rocks by reacting chemically at the surface of the rock and by changing mineral compounds into compounds that are soluble in water. One of the most common reactions occurs when carbon dioxide dissolves in water to form weak carbonic acid. When this comes in contact with limestone, a chemical reaction changes it to calcium bicarbonate, which dissolves easily in water. This simple process is responsible for many large and beautiful caverns around the world. If you have seen a dark gray or black rock covered with a red or yellow powder, you have seen a common chemical weathering process in action. Dark rocks like this basalt contain iron. The iron in the surface of the rock reacts with oxygen in the air to form iron oxide. The iron oxide, like calcium bicarbonate, is soluble in water. We see this reaction every day and call it rusting. Another common weathering reaction involves the addition of water to a compound to create another compound with different properties. One example of this process is the transformation of insoluble hematite to water-soluble limonite, which serves as a common cement holding some sedimentary rocks together. There are many different chemical weathering reactions, but their common characteristic is the production of mineral compounds that are soluble in water. Once these compounds have been produced, water moving through the soil can leach away the material, changing the composition of the remaining soil. As water flows down or away from the site where the minerals were dissolved, it carries the minerals to other locations. The rate at which fresh rock breaks down to soil depends on many things. The kind of rock, the size of the particles involved, the climate, and the topographic conditions. All play a role in determining whether an area will be covered with a deep layer of soil or be bare rock. If you have walked along a road or near a stream, perhaps you've seen a bank like this one. You can see that there are layers in the bank, and in each layer, different weathering processes are at work. Down at the bottom of the bank, here at bedrock, weathering processes are converting large rocks into smaller rocks. As we move up the bank, the rock fragments decrease in size and number, while the amount of clay and iron oxide increase until we reach the totally weathered soil which lies several feet above bedrock. This layer is a subsoil and is usually light reddish tan or brown. As we continue up the bank, the amount of clay decreases while the amount of organic matter increases. As this change takes place, the color changes from light red to gray. But the layer is very thin soon there is much organic matter and very little clay. The next layer is true topsoil. It is dark in color and contains an equal mix of mineral and organic matter. Here, just below the leaves, is a layer rich in fungus and lichen, with many small animals such as worms, snails, and slugs. One handful of this soil may contain as many living organisms as there are people living in the world. There is a great deal of activity in this layer as the organisms break down leaves and other dead organic material. This layer is loose and still contains only partially decomposed material, so we'll call it humus. Finally, at the very top is a layer of loose leaves, sticks, and organic debris. 
not all soils look like this one. The kind of bedrock, the climate, and the time involved are just a few of many factors that help determine the type and depth of soil in an area. In many ways, soil is our most valuable natural resource. Like oil and coal, it takes many years to form, and when it's used up, it is almost impossible to replace. We depend on soil for almost every kind of activity, and the type of soil in an area helps determine whether we succeed or fail. Homes built on soil with a high clay content often have problems as the soil swells in wet weather and shrinks during dry spells, causing foundations to crack. Here is another problem caused by soil that contains a great deal of silt and clay. The soil does not drain well. As a result of wet weather, the septic tanks for these homes may overflow, allowing raw sewage to stand in the lawns and ditches. Such a situation is a potential health hazard. Some soils like these along this river are flat and were formed by flooding. Their high nutrient content and texture make them excellent for growing crops. But homes built on such a plain run the risk of flooding with costly property damage. Unstable soils on hillsides may slide in wet weather or during earthquakes, destroying yards and homes or closing roads. This earthquake damage occurred in Alaska in 1964, largely because of the unstable soil conditions. Perhaps soil's most important function is its use in agriculture. We rely heavily on soil for growing crops and for raising timber and pasturage. Yet here too, the kind of soil and the way we use it are most important. Farmers on the Great Plains learned this lesson the hard way near the turn of the century. Winds blowing across vast areas of plowed land raise dust storms destroying crops and farms. Today, after years of labor, windbreaks and other proper land use practices have partially restored the land. But this land may never be restored. Erosion on this slope began because of overgrazing and these gullies resulted as the pasture surface washed away in heavy rains. The soil which has washed away can never be replaced. Where the soil is unstable and subject to erosion, the damage can be reduced by proper placement of erosion barriers. But the wisest course in the long run is proper planning for land use that will protect and improve our soil. For when it is gone, it will take many hundreds of years to replace.